okay thank you good evening uh, i'm kamala gunawardena actually uh, former chairman of the civil engineer section committee uh, today i would like to uh, start the session by introducing from the resource person but actually there is na uh, no need to uh, there is nothing new but as a as a formality i welcome everyone for this uh, for this lecture which is uh, our professor is uh, doing it very greatly and this is an, uh, again actually a continuation <laughs> of the previous lecture it's, so reinforced concrete is commonly used as for building so he is going <laughs> deeper in this continuing the contents of this uh, lecture and he will be continuing this even today so i welcome everyone for the lecture and uh, yeah. professor welcome you as this uh, honor with a with a great honor and uh, to do the lecture so i think with this not i will hand over the session to professor it's over to you professor thank you so first i'll share the screen okay sir this what i showed last time uh there is a note bandu our engineer bandu has already shared it and yeah, it has a yes. lot of impo important data uh, like uh, how to create the load combinations then about concrete we discussed a lot about properties of concrete and then uh, the design equations why you get this 0.85 fck divided divided by gamma c giving 0.567 and the the limit of uh, this uh, you know rectangular parabolic region and the rectangular region from 0.002 to 0.0035 i told you these are valid only up to 60 megapascal cube strength or 50 megapascal cylinder strength if you are going to have a bigger strength these will be lesser values because concrete becomes brittle as it becomes uh, stronger and this is the magic number c5060 and then steel reinforcement also we have a special situation because we are now not using 460 steel that gave 400 as the strength or a strain of 0.002 now we get a strain of 0.00217 in uh, bs code we got a strain limit of 0.002 here because we were using 460 steel having uh, a working stress of 400 but uh, now we are using 500 strain steel having a bigger working stress uh, that is 500 multiplied by 0.85 which is about 530 maybe and uh, then you get 0.0217 so those are the changes so uh, this has not changed this is the same for bs code and euro code and this uh, you, bs code did not talk anything about 60 megapascal so this is okay but euro codes go up to 105 megapascal cube strength or 90 megapascal cylinder strength so uh, these values will change so just keep it in mind don't use the same equation without worry so we have to be concerned about it then we have these uh, you know uh, cover conditions and uh, generally our cover condition will be xc3 and uh, xc4 can be for bridges five bridges xc3 is the normal cover condition for uh, buildings and xc3 If you are using anything, uh, anything less than C thirty five forty, so if you are using uh, C thirty thirty seven, C thirty thirty seven, and uh, so here, here you can't do any modification if you are using C thirty 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 seven. Then the cover is for the normal condition is fifty year lifespan. The cover requirement is twenty five. 
but euro code says uh, you know you have to allow 10 millimeters for tolerances so the cover requirement in euro code is 35 but if you are using high strength concrete so if that if the concrete strength is more than 35 45 reduce the class by one so then you have to you don't have to look at s4 you look at s3 and you need 20 millimeter cover so 20 plus 10 is 30 so if you are using a concrete like 50 megapascal or 45 megapascal or 50 megapascal cube strength the cover requirement is 30 otherwise 35 so that's what you have to it's a simple number to remember cover requirement is 35 whatever it is because we are not going to use uh, 50 megapascal concrete for slabs and beams it's useless uh, 50 megapascal is needed only for columns so you don't have to do anything like that so just 30 megapascal concrete that is usually used 30 megapascal is very sufficient for sri lanka but you can see the cover requirement is 25 plus 10 30 and this is much bigger than the usual value that we uh, encounter with uh, bs codes uh, and most of the time you will find the cover requirement is 25 or 30 millimeters and uh, usual rule that we use is for slabs if you want you can use 20 millimeter cover for beams 25 millimeter cover for columns 30 millimeter cover minimum so many engineers use the values like 25 millimeters for the slabs uh, 30 millimeters for the beams 40 millimeters for the columns so that was the rule in bs but you can see in euro codes it is 35 millimeters for all even in slabs you need 35 millimeters unless you can assure that the slab is cast with special precautions that uh, 25 millimeter cover can be assured uh, sometimes you know you can it's very easy to take cover meter cover meter readings and assure that uh, you know the 25 millimeter cover is there so in slabs if you want you can use 25 millimeter cover but you have to do a survey and show the 25 millimeter is there so that is uh, something extra so it's much easier to just keep 35 millimeter cover in the slabs as well so uh, but if you want to have a really thin slab you want to optimize it then you need 25 millimeter cover for the slabs and uh, then uh, you have to buy a cover meter and uh, do, when you are doing the concrete do it carefully so that uh, 25 millimeter cover can be verified and uh, you know assured so so that is the situation but if you are doing a say 150 millimeter slab Keeping 35 millimeter cover will assure a building that will not have any problem over a very long period. Sometimes the, now this S4 is for 50 year design. If you want a 100 year design life, what are you going to do? Slab geometry. So if it is 100 year, increase the class by 2. So you have to say, not S4, you have to go for S6. Now you can see the cover requirement is 35. 35 plus 10 is 45. So so but 35 but if you are using uh, fifth so if you are if you want a very high durability then you will go for high strength concrete 45 megapascal then you can reduce it by one that means s5 is 30. so that means if you want a 100 year lifespan what you need is 40 millimeter cover what you need is 40 millimeter cover uh, otherwise you can do a survey and assure if you can assure 30 millimeter then you can even use 30 so rather than worrying about all these numbers i generally say in euro code the cover requirement is 30 in slabs you can reduce it to 10 but you have to do the slab concreting carefully assuring 25 millimeter cover that's a good but if you are not going to be concerned about it even in the slabs you have to give 35 millimeter cover is that clear one yes sir that, that is clear sir that is clear right yes right sir. So, so this uh, now I think you can you can you have a good idea how to use this table. So if you have a, so for, for example, if I'm precasting a slab, the so when you are precasting the slab, uh, you have no problem. You can assure the cover very easily. So you don't need the clear tolerance, and you can reduce the class by one. You can reduce the class by one. That means S3. So if you are precasting a slab, what is the covering count? Twenty minutes. Right? If you are precasting a slab, cover requirement is 20. If you are not precasting, 25. But when you are not precasting, better to have the 
tolerance, 10, 35. But if you are going to verify, again you can go for 25. So, because cover is the main reason for durability. So, Euro code identify this very clearly and they they have placed a lot of emphasis on the cover. Especially the people uh, doing construction haphazardly, not uh, paying enough attention to the cover, where they don't use proper cover blocks, they don't keep up enough cover. For such uh, situations, the uh, Eurocode is very specific. They say keep a tolerance. And for bridges, you can see the cover is uh, about 5 millimeter more. So the cover in bridges should be 40 millimeter. Cover in bridges should be 40 millimeter, whereas in buildings it can be 35 millimeter, but can be reduced to 25 in slabs, provided that you are careful. So it's not a major deviation, only about 5 millimeter extra in the Euro code than what you have used in the British code. So it's not a major thing, but you have to keep in mind the cover is 35 millimeters. Right now, then we looked at members subjected to flexure, and then I showed you how this uh, happens. and uh, how to uh, derive this k factor, k is equal to m over bd squared fck, and then this equation, and then use this equation, m is equal to force multiplied by lever arm, because this equation gives lever arm, this equation gives moment, so force multiplied by lever arm is the moment, the only unknown here is the area of steel. So you can straight away find the area of steel. And we did one example. And uh, we showed, then I showed, there's a shortcut method. You don't have to do a, use any of these equations. Just find MOBD squared, divide by four, and that is equal to 100 days over BD. But uh, that is a shortcut for any side situation. You have, a, you, you have doubt, use that method. But don't use that method for designs. Uh, use this method for designs. Is that clear? Right? Use this method for designs. Yes, but whenever, you know, as uh, engineers, we need rules of thumb. A lot of rules of thumb. Why? When you have rules of thumb, we can, you know, we can show that we are knowledgeable. Right? So somebody asks a question. We don't say, okay, I have to go and do calculations and give you an answer. We just say, okay, give, just, just give me one second. And use the rule of thumb, get an approximate answer, and tell the people, okay, this is the this is what's going to happen. This will need three numbers of 20 millimeter bars. So the people around you will wonder how how this engineer is doing all these calculations in a fraction of a second. And he she must be a brilliant engineer. Otherwise, you know, how could you say the reinforcement requirement in a beam having a depth of 600? Width of 300, span is 6 meters, is 3 numbers of 20 millimeter bars. And uh, a young engineer would quickly check it on his uh, computer program, Excel sheet, and he confirms, so, okay, this engineer is uh, correct. Yeah, his, his answer is correct. Then the people will start wondering, how on earth you do all these calculations, but you have your own set of simple calculations. So that is the uh, call. Heuristics or rules of thumb. So the rule of thumb is, you know, a shortcut. Pretty accurate. Not 100%. But it gives a close enough answer. Uh, when you are doing uh, some, you know, some work which needs, uh, uh, be, where you have to see the big picture. Now, when you are designing a building, there are two levels that you can do the design. The first is, the primary design, where you get all the general arrangement drawing properly done, with the or when you are selecting the structural form to be used, the general arrangement drawing, where you look at the all natural step systems, right? Come up with the most economical step system. So that is the primary part of the design. So, so if you get the primary part of the design correct only, you can do the. We can do an economical design. Otherwise, you can do a design. The moment that design is shown to a person who knows how to do value engineering. For example, I'm very good in doing value engineering. And uh, I might say, okay, don't worry. I will do this project. 
the structure for you at 80% of what this design has done, uh, which means a saving of maybe 500 million rupees, provided that you give me 10% of what I say. 10% of what I say, right? 10% of 500 million is 50 million. So that's how some uh, engineers, uh, you know, uh, use, uh, earn a lot of money. Uh, so there are a few engineers who are really good at that. And uh, so so they, they earn money this way because whenever they see an average design, they offer the value engineering solution. In value engineering, uh, if it is a tendered, already tendered, project where the contractor comes up with value engineering and uh, let's say the project value is uh, 5000 million the, the the contractor sees the opportunity for value engineering and he says okay i'm going to save 1000 million or i'm going to do the project at 80% of this cost then what happens then the then the client will say, okay, I will allow you to come up with a solution on one agreement according to FIDIC, uh, conditions of uh, contract. Uh, when you do value engineering, 50% belongs to the client. So the project cost is, cost is uh, 5,000 million. It will become 4,500 million because uh, the contract is going to save 1,000 million, right? So 5,000. 80% is 4,000, saving is 1,000. Out of that, half belongs to the client. So client gets a saving of 500 million. Contract also gets a saving of 500 million. So, so this uh, 1,000 million, the, the fee of the value engineer is 100, 100 million, 10%. And value engineer gets 100 million. Contract gets a profit of 400 million. So without doing a single thing, by doing a value engineering, the contractor gets 400 million. But on the other hand, uh, the contractor would need uh, far better quality assurance and quality controlling during the construction. So uh, the contractor may have to hire about 8 to 10 young engineers who will keep an eye on the construction aspects strictly so that, uh, you know, the optimization can be uh, realized properly in the actual structure. Now, that's how the projects like Altair was done. Altair had 24-hour surveillance at the site by young engineers. Some, some, some contractors are reluctant to uh, you know, employ engineers, thinking that uh, engineers are expensive. But uh, the reality is, if you have engineers at the site, as quality assurance, quality controlling, and quality assurance engineers, uh, you know they can be uh, they can make things happen. So, so when you go for value engineering, value engineer will say, "Okay, I'm going to bring you a big profit. Out of your profit of 400 million, keep aside 50 million for the salaries of these extra engineers who are going to make it happen properly. Because we can't have you know haphazard construction." When you do value engineering, value engineering means very accurate, high quality construction, which can be done by normal people, provided that there's a special team of quality controlling and quality assurance engineers who are going to keep records. And the value engineer will certainly provide all the knowledge needed, but he cannot provide the supervision. Supervision has to come with, a, a, with by employing a lot of young engineers who can provide 24 hour surveillance, even if a concrete is done over 24 hours, there will be three shifts of engineers who will take over from eight, eight hour shifts. So like this, you have to have engineers. Some, you can't have one engineer doing uh, say 18 hour shifts or something like that. You have to have many engineers doing eight hour shifts so that the quality controlling quality assurance part can be properly recorded and all the record copy keeping will be there. And you can use a database for record keeping. You don't have to write everything on paper, but uh, everything can go into a notebook. But uh, every day, all the data is entered, and you have to have an up-to-date database. So if any anything goes wrong on a particular day, all the information of what happened, including the photographic evidence, 
and video evidence will be there. So this is a new level of construction that you need in Sri Lanka because uh, of uh, very high construction cost with average designs. Now many clients are seeking value engineered solutions where the cost of construction will be low but the quality assurance scheme will be tough. So that's the way forward uh, when we are in a crisis where the steel prices are extremely high, something like including that it is about 350 to 355,000 retail. But for contractors, large con contracts, uh, you know, they can get steel from 220,000 to 245,000 per ton uh, without that, without that. So that component is not important for most of the property developers and so on because finally they are going to charge the web that from the people who are buying the property. So, so though they claim the pay that, that can be claimed back. So basically that is not a problem for property developers. And uh, anyway, the people who buy apartment had to pay 15% VAT. Now they have to pay 18% VAT. So it's not a major burden. It's only 3% increase. But on the other hand, if you do value engineering and bring the cost down drastically, say bring the construction cost down by 25%, then, then you can pass part of that advantage to the buyers. And finally, you will find buyers are actually paying less. Though the VAT is 18%, buyers are paying less because engineers have been smart. So what we need is smart engineers in future who are very conversant with the latest advances of Eurocode, latest possibilities allowed by Eurocode. Is that clear, Bandhu? Yes, sir. That is clear. Very clear. So, so you have a lot of challenges. You can't be practicing as you have done early. You have to be a smart engineer who can come up with the most cost economical solution which will allow a Final product at a lower cost, where the where the clients who are going to buy your product will have to pay less, despite a higher market. So that is the way forward because we are in a time where we are trying to uh, mold Sri Lanka as a, a developed country like Australia or England. In Australia or England, that is there for everything. And whenever you buy something, you get a VAT receipt. So, in Australia, I mean, uh, value engineers are earning a lot of money because whenever they see a design, uh, they do value engineering. And builders always go for value engineers. And when they get win the contract, they get a, they get a value engineer solution. And then they give part of the benefit to the client. They keep a net profit without doing anything. Now they keep a net profit and the value engineers are also paid in a healthy manner. And uh, one good example is, you know, if possible, I will try and get one lecture organized by him. And he's uh, an engineer from Melbourne who's running Ranjan Panandu Consulting Engineers firm for geotechnical designs. And uh, his task is to do an engineering and reduce the cost. And uh, he told me last year alone he has spent uh, 130,000 uh, Australian dollars to Pampas Sri Lanka, which is about 26 million rupees. So he has spent 26 million rupees on airfare alone because he travels uh, uh, business class and even higher. So that's the kind of money the the value engineers learn. So value engineering is something that you all should try to learn. I'll, I'll try to teach how you can do it, but it is an art. So I can teach to a certain extent, extent but I can't teach it 100% because it is something that you, you yourself would have to develop by knowing a lot of facts about this. So, But I'll try to, uh, you know, the whole idea of this lecture series is to take you there. But how well you go there will all depend on how much effort you put into this. Right. Now, if you look at this X, 
that is the depth to the neutral axis. If you look at this S, it is 0.8 times X. If you look at Z, Z cannot be very large. Why? Z, the maximum depth is 0.8 X. So, maximum value of Z, so minimum value of Z is 0.82 times D. It is given as a function of D. But, uh, sometimes you get a Z value less greater than 0.995 D, which means very little thin layer of concrete is available for cabin compression. We don't like that situation. So we have a maximum limit of Z as 0.95 D. So you have to keep in mind, Z as a maximum limit of 0.95 D, Z as a minimum value of 0.82 D. So that is a theory. Be because uh, because uh, that happens because X has a maximum value of 0.45. X has a maximum value of 0.45. And last time I explained why we need a X of 0.45 D. Why? Because when this reaches 0 0.0035, this has to be more than 0 0.0035. Reason? Because we like steel to yield and concrete to crack. And give us a warning before it fails. So, and this type of beams are called under reinforced beams. So, any beam having a neutral axis less than 0, uh, 0.45 D, neutral depth of the neutral axis less than 0.45 D is called under reinforced beams. But if you have a beam with a lot of reinforcement where XOD is, exceeds 0.45 D, then it's over reinforced. So, what can you gather from this? Don't provide too much reinforcement. If you need, Three numbers of 20 millimeter bars. The maximum you will provide is you will provide two numbers of 20 millimeter bars and one number of 25. You will not go for anything beyond that. And uh, what is the reason for that? So let's have a look at it. So I'm not, not, not I'm going to go to the sheet now. So, so let's see why we need. Why we like to provide little reinforcement at certain sections extra. Some uh, places we don't like to provide any extra reinforcement. And with that, I'm going to explain something called moment redistribution. Now, how many of you do undertake moment redistribution when you are doing the designs? How much re no, moment redistribution that you undertake? So these are important questions. And uh, so... Uh, and also, I would like the beams to be uh, singly reinforced. I like the beams to be singly reinforced. So I'm going to explain some of those things now. Right. Now, when you look at uh, concrete, now what do you know about concrete? Concrete is, uh, is based on natural materials. Concrete is based on natural materials. Okay. So we have concrete. The concrete. What are the ingredients for concrete? Concrete. Cement. Based on limestone. Clay. Natural materials. Sand. Metal. So, all these are natural materials. Now we mine sand. We manufacture sand. We manufacture sand. We mine sand. We dredge sand. Dredge the sea. Now all these will have environmental cost. Are we paying that? We are not paying the environment. We crush the metal. Originally, when this uh, rock is available all over Sri Lanka, so we can cut it. We can never end it. But it may have some environmental cost. Are we paying? Cement gives out carbon dioxide. So it has an environmental cost. So today is the uh, 3rd December 2024. Uh, January, 3rd January 2024, Civil Engineering Section Committee Lecture Series 
today's lecture is fifth lecture fifth yes page number 1 right fifth lecture and page number one. so all these have environmental cost huge environmental cost because cement production is responsible for 7% of greenhouse giving gas emissions are we paying for this are we i mean how many cement companies at least try to manage a forest or go for tree planting we have so many cement suppliers how many are you know allocating little money to have a tree planting campaign in sri lanka using the school children or university undergraduates very few but these are huge enormous costs. so concrete is cheap why not that it is cheap if we pay for the environment damage it is not cheap but it is very very cheap still recycle even the even the billers that you import from any country most of the time they will have about uh, 25 to 80% recycle content sometimes it can be as high as 90 recycling is okay because it needs less energy than uh, making steel from iron ores but what is bad is recycling at lower temperatures you do the recycling at high temperatures using uh, steel so using electric furnaces then recycling is good no problem so you will find uh, you know most of the countries having hydropower those are the countries where the steel uh, you know converting steel from steel ore is uh, carried out in all the other countries they do uh, recycle because converting steel ores ores to steel needs lot of energy but recycling needs less energy so recycle recycling is good no harm but you can you do it using electric coils not using gas because gas cannot give the correct temperature sometimes so you have to do the correct recycle and in sri lanka some people recycle without using gas uh, powered systems uh, which may not be the ideal the ideal is to go for electric powered uh, recycle so we have two materials on one side we have concrete this side is here steel concrete is very good in carrying compression concrete is very good in carrying compression steel can carry compression or steel or uh, tensile steel can carry both now so my perception is if concrete is good use concrete to carry because concrete is cheap use that to carry compression use steel only to carry tension to get a situation where you have to doubly reinforce the section like this what is the meaning what is the meaning meaning is wasteful design design by selecting a too small section at ga level general energy at ga level uh, you have selected two small section is is not good is not good. so how do you do the selection okay when you do a design say let's say this is the grid this way 7 meters this way 6 meters so i'm going to use a slab of 160 mm now again you last why 160 is a odd number now why you are now you can have 90 100 110 120 130 140 150 160 
Now, what are those thicknesses that you use? Use 100, use 125, or numbers 150, 175, 200. Why? Those are odd numbers. Those odd numbers have gone on imperial system. Now, we are in the metric system. We have to get rid of this imperial system based mentality. Okay, so use 160. Or 170 rather than using 175. So, because the deflection has to be satisfied because there's a span of six meters, there's a possibility of satisfying this deflection criteria using 160, but 170 may be preferred because then you can reduce the amount of steel uh, needed. So, let's say 160 or 170. So, that means what would I know? I know. Uh, let's say I am using 170, multiplied by 25 is the dead load. And then uh, I would have, uh, you know, 1 kilonewton per meter squared for finishers, uh, services, sorry, services plus uh, finishers, and another one for partitions, plus uh, an impost load of 2.5. Then I can calculate. What is 1.35 TK plus 1.5 QK, which will come to about uh, 12 to 13. So, you calculate them. So, immediately you know the value 12 to 13, and you know in this slab the loads are going to come like this. So, it is, uh, so this is going to get more load. Uh, this is going to get. Uh, the 7 meter is going to get more load. So the load on 7 meter span is uh, is uh, 13, 13 on this side, 13 into 3. So 39 comes from this side, 39 comes from this side. So I have considered this value is 13. 1.35 dk plus 1.5 qk is 30. So if it is 13, 39 will come from this side, 39 will come from this side, but, but because it's trapezoidal, I'll say 80% percent of, percent of 79 will come, so 78 will come. So the load will be about uh, 65 kilonewtons per meter. So with some simple calculation, you can straight away decide what is the load that is going to come onto this beam. So it is 65 kilonewtons per meter. So this page number two. So 65 kilonewtons per meter. So what do you do? Then you will say, okay, page number three, 65 is going to be a continuous beam. So the so you get a bending moment diagram like this. So this value will be about W S card or 10. So it is 65 multiplied by 7 square divided by 10. But the what's the value here? 65 into 7 square divided by 10? One minute, sir. Yeah. We have 318.5. Yeah, 18. So let's say 320. Because we are doing approximate calculation, right? 320. Now, let's say I have selected a beam, right? And uh, the beam is uh, 300 wide, 600 deep. So what is the, what is the MOBD square? 320 into 10 to the power 6, moment, MOBD square. Depth is 300, depth is uh, 545, uh, 35, 45. What is the value of the word? Uh, 3.59. 3.59. 59. So if it is less than 3, it's very good. Because if you look at that chart, you see that you know these values are, are pretty comfortable with uh, values like 3 because it's in the straight portion. So what I do is now I'll, I'll select 350. Now what will happen if I select 350? 
to fight. So what did they say? Moby is correct. Yes, so also you divide it, multiply it by 300 and divide by 350. You get 3.2. 3.2. Yeah. 3.2. So that's good. Even 3.59 is not a problem. Why? So this is not going to be as a rectangle beam. This is going to be as a flange beam. So that means, what is the reinforcement arrangement? Singly or doubly? Singly. No reinforcement needed at the top because it's a flange beam. So that means, this can be used, this can be used, which is more economical. Maybe this is more economical. Because it's going to behave not as a rectangular beam in the span, going to behave as a rectangle. It is going to behave as a branch. Right? Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. So, so you have already seen all these uh, rules of thumb given by various people. But what is the way I select the general arrangement? I select the general arrangement drawing so that all beams will be singly reinforced. Why? Doubly reinforced beams are very expensive. What is the reason? For concrete, we don't pay for the environmental cost. For manufactured steel that is imported, there's huge amount of steel, energy component in it. So steel is very expensive. It is very, very expensive. One meter cube of concrete can be made for 22,000 rupees at the site without transportation. Right? For the, as the material cost, as the material cost, I'm not talking about labor cost, right? 22,000. As a material cost, right? But one ton of steel, it varies without wet, 220 to 245,000 per ton. For what? For, for the people who are doing contracts, big contracts, they can get steel at a low price because they are purchasing huge quantities and manufacturers will give the biggest benefit. Including the advertising cost because there is no advertising cost. Whereas when they are selling the steel, they are competing in a small market with many players. So there will be huge advertising cost. So the including right, one ton of steel will be 350. Can you see how the numbers vary? Banduk, if it is the steel is 245,000, 18% VAT. What is the value? If the run of steel is 245,000 with 18% VAT, what is the value a contractor will pay? You have to multiply 245,000 by 1.18. What is the value? 289,100. Yeah. So something that the contractor gets for 289,000, yes. a normal house builder pays 355,000. But uh, for the for the construction, the, the, the contractor, it's that free. So they get it one at 45,000. Whereas, the well, VAT is paid by the client. And client will finally recover the VAT from the buyer, buyers of the apartment or buyers of the building. will have to pay the VAT. Okay. So you can see, uh, for contractor, it comes at one at 45,000. So that's why, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, the apartments can be sold at a very competitive price uh, than a, a house. Because uh, apartment, you have, uh, say, 60 perch land and uh, 80 apartments. So the land value is divided by 80. So the land value component is very low. And it is done by a construction firm where VAT is not included in the cost. So finally, VAT is uh, recovered from the buyer. So even if the buyer pays 80% VAT, if the engineers are smart, they can make a product which costs less. And finally, you'll find buying an apartment is far more profitable than buying a house 
or buying a block of land and building your own house. Now, this will all happen if the designers are uh, smart and they know these facts. When the building is designed, all the beams are singly reinforced. No beam is doubly reinforced. Is that clear? Now, I'm, I'm gradually coming to value in the Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Clear, sir. Right? So, is that the way you would have thought earlier? I mean, have you thought about the final product or you would have thought about the completion of a design? I'm sure most of you would have thought about completion of design, but not the value engineering component in it. Yes, sir. Most, of the time, yeah? most yeah. of the time, you want to find the reinforcement. You are not, you are not interested in finding whether yes. it's an optimum solution. Is that right? Correct, sir. Yeah. So, but you are now thinking differently. Why? We are in a crisis. We are in a crisis. In a crisis situation, what we need? We need innovation. So I'm talking about innovation that you can uh, actually use. So that's the important thing. Okay? Yes, sir. Right. Now let's see the next part. Now I'm going to come to another very important aspect of structural design now. Now let's say we have a beam. Six meters, seven meters, six meters. Now you might ask why I selected seven meters for the middle. Actually, when you have a three span, uh, if you make the center span slightly bigger, it's good. Why? First load case. What is first load case? All loaded maximum. So this is governing, this is the maximum. These are maximum. But when you draw the shear force diagram, shear is again maximum. So this case, case one governs shear. It covers the bending moment or the support. Okay. It covers this. And then you have the second load case where you put this as maximum, this as minimum, this as maximum. So what will happen? It will go like this. Then you have the third load case where you put this as maximum, others are minimum, so you get. Now you have an envelope. And what we should do is we must redistribute the box. Why? Because concrete behaves as a plastic material. Plastic material. Steel behaves as an elastic material. Later it will go into plastic zone. But our analysis is elastic. So, in the analysis, we have assumed we are here. Now, how do you relate an analysis where we have assumed that it behaves elastic, whereas the actual substrate behaves plastic, which means this beam is capable of forming hinges at these positions. And allow, so once of once it is formed, any extra node will be taken by a bending moment diagram like this, where if this is W1, this will be W1 is squared for it. Any extra node. Until the plastic hinges are formed, it's like the elastic. Once the plastic hinges are formed, it will be like this. So the codes allowed, BS, BS code allowed it, British code allowed it. So, BS code allows, Euro code allows, 
you can reduce this movement up to 30 percent reduce this movement up to 30 percent but i generally prefer about 10 percent easy otherwise when it is more than 20 10 percent you have to do extra you have to you cannot use the normal uh, equation you have to you have to modify the design equation so i generally prefer 10 percent so what happens i have a bending moment diagram going like that I'm going to, let's say the value is uh, 300. I'm going to design it for 270. And I'm going to design this for 270. Then what will happen to the this moment? This moment should be increased. So how do you find, how to find how much should be increased? So what you do is you will draw a line here with 30 here, 30 here. And you this as a new origin, new origin of the bending moment diagram. Then what is this value? Let's say this has to be at the about 220. Now what is the design moment here? 250. What is the design moment here? 270. You get a situation like this. But what is the more efficient section? So here, it is cracked here, and it's a rectangular section at the support. In the in the span, it's a flange section. So only this concrete is here. Lever arm is huge, very efficient. Flanged section. So. What will you use? Okay, it's it's worth transferring moment from here to here. Why? This is very efficient. This is not efficient. And then uh, when you are doing the concrete, now you have you are, you are doing concrete like this, pouring from the top. And if you have a lot of reinforcement here, or support, can you pour the concrete? No, you can't pour the concrete. Concrete doesn't go in. Now this is a, a construction problem. So it's worth. We distribute in the moment. And the most important thing you have to understand is we have a column, 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 the columns, a lot of columns. And can a being fail here? If it cracks here, can it fail? No. Can it fail if it cracks here? Yes, no support. It can fail if it cracks. This is crack, but no deflection. Here it will crack and it will deflect like this. So, what is the best occasion to have a crack at support? So, no extra reinforcement at support. Why? If you put extra reinforcement, then you are going to hinder the concrete. Now, and because it's not going to fail, so no, no extra reinforcement is needed. It will never fail or the column. It will form a plastic thing. No problem. It's allowed. But where will it fail? Here. So where do you need extra reinforcement? This is just fine. Be a little generous. So when you do it in the flange beam, you do all your calculations in the reinforced because it's flange. And you have, you need, 3T, 3H20, you provide 2H20 plus 1H20. Why? Because uh, even if the beam, beam is overloaded, what will happen if the beam is overloaded? Which section will uh, have a problem? Yes. At the support, it will form a crack. No problem. And it is accepted. What will finally fail? The span. What is going to fail finally is the span. What are you going to do? You have to put little very much start and put in the span. It's going to fail. Will it ever fail? Even if it's overloaded. Manduka, will it ever fail? Will the beam ever fail? No. No. Oh, no, sir. Is that the way you have done the designs? 
you provide extra reinforcement over the support, you provide extra reinforcement in the span. Is that right? Yeah. You will not look at it this way. But this is the correct way of looking at reinforced concrete. So when I am designing, I will never provide anything extra over support. Just a calculated value. If I can uh, say there's a violation of 10 or 20 or 30 millimeters squared, I will not even bother to do that. I will just provide even less, five less, because we know I can go up to 30% redistribution. I have done only 10% redistribution. So provide is slightly less than calculated. Over support is accepted. Provided you have provided something extra in the span. Right. But that is not the way reinforced concrete is designed and taught. Always make sure you provide something extra at all sections. Is that right, Bandhuga? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yeah, you will always provide something extra at the support, something extra in this span. Yes. But what is the safety? No safety. Because if something goes wrong, what you have provided extra is only a little extra. But what I say is, provide something substantially extra in the span because that's the section that's going to fit. Got it. So I have provided not just a little. I have provided uh, 20 millimeter bias 340, 25 millimeter bias 490. So how would I detail that beam then? How would I detail this beam? Because if you look at the moments, it's likely that I will get three numbers of. So I get two H20. And I will provide one H20. I provide one H20. Or it could be even one H60. Now here I will provide two H20. But here I will provide one H25. Can you see how I uh, detail the beam? Because, uh, I, I don't mind providing less here because I am providing more here and I am providing less in a less efficient section. This I am providing more in a very efficient section. I am providing more in a very efficient section. So which will have a higher increase in moment capacity. This will have a huge increase in moment capacity. Delta M is very big. Here the delta M is very small. So no point in providing anything, so provide less. Even if you provide less, the, the amount that you lose is very small, whereas by providing more here, you are going to gain a lot. Then you have to keep in mind that, you know, we have 1.35 dK plus 1.5 dK. Huge assessment and 1 kilonewton per meter square for partitions. Probably never comes Maximum load of partition will be 0.5. So, so when you are designing, you have to be very practical. Very practical. Right? Think what's going to do, what are you doing? And provide the reinforcement accordingly. That way, you can do wonders with your designs, and your designs will be extremely economical, competitive. No person can come and do value engineering for your designs. And that's what we need from practicing engineers because your duty is to give the best for the client. What is the reason? For doing some calculations, you are paid 1% of the cost of the structure. So the structural engineer's charge should be 1% of the total cost. Of the Why? Because this includes supervision. Whether you are computer supervision or Theoretic separation, whatever it is, it's no supposition. So, you should not do any design for less than 1% of the total cost of the project. But if you are doing it for the structural cost, it should be at least 2% of the structural cost. Why? By doing it for 2% of the structural cost, as an engineer, you are going to save 20 to 30% cost. You tell the client, okay, you hire me, I'll save 20 to 30% in the cost. But you pay me 2%. Then you can see you are charging 10% of the what you see. 
and the saving cannot be done doing normal designs. You have to do special designs. Thinking completely out of box. Is that clear? That is clear, sir. So you can see these are new philosophy, right? Not 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 a typical reinforced concrete design teaching that you always get at universities. This is far different. Even at MSc level, you would have learned at this. This kind of concepts because you know now uh, with Eurocode only we decided okay now time is enough is enough because Eurocode allow us to do a lot of uh, you know uh, economical designs by stretching the materials to the limit so we are going to uh, develop this so uh, this kind of things I uh, I was doing but uh, I thought it should actually we should bring it into uh, the teaching. Uh, because initially what happens is we get engineers who have not seen even a structure or concrete. We have to read them reinforced concrete design. So we struggled a lot with them because they don't understand most of the things we tell. So we have no time to tell all these important things. Then we get uh, students for MSc and they have, some of them have forgotten most of the things they have learned at the university. So again, we can't do much. But uh, later I thought, okay, now we cannot be complacent like that. We have to teach this. So that's why I thought, okay, let's teach the practicing engineers the mistakes that they do in design so that they can start optimizing and uh, they can do the designs that nobody can ever do anywhere. So that's the target of this lecture series. Uh, you all of you are to be regular designers, but uh, nobody can do value engineering for your designs. So that's our task. Okay, Vandhuga? Okay, sir. And sir, uh, what can we do to uh, take these value engineering tips and things to practicing engineers? Uh, I mean, from this lecture no, series. No, actually, actually, now, 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 I'm one by one, I'm going to disclose this uh, a different way of thinking about structures. That different way of thinking is the one that value engineers use. So, for a value engineer, a slab cannot be 150 or 170 millimeters. It can be anything like 130, 140, 150. And he will try his best to go for 130. So how much he sells? 20 millimeters each slab. 50 story building. 20 into 50. 1 meter. So he sells 1 meter thick concrete. Having a weight of 25 kilonewtons per meter square. So what will happen to the foundation load? Will be reduced by 25 kilonewtons per meter square. Just because the engineer was smart enough to consider 130 as the slab, not 150. Because we are measuring in with the tape. So tape has 10 intervals. Whether you use 130 or 150, always you can maintain it. Right? So that if it is if you need 175, as you just you look at it, so you try 150. And a 60, and a 70, and 180. Most likely it will be 160 that you can manage. Or sometimes you find uh, you find 170. Sometimes you find uh, because of deflection criteria and so on, uh, 170 actually gives a more economical design because it needs less steel, though the, they need a little bit of concrete extra. The concrete is a very cheap material. If you save a lot, lot of steel, it is going to be cheap. So you will. You'll, you can not do one calculation. You will do two calculations. One for 160, one for 170. Calculate the steel quantity with a rough detailed drawing. And then you decide whether to use 160 or 170 in this 50 story building. Why? Because if you save 10 millimeters, you are going to save 500 millimeters or 50 meters. 50 meters. So, for everything, it is not one calculation. So your task is not to find red percent. Your task is to find the optimum solution. And generally, engineers do not spend time finding optimum solutions. Why? Because they spend a lot of time finding the reinforcement. They find Z is equal to D 0.5 plus. 0.25 minus K over 
they do all these calculations. M is equal to 0.87 F by K A S multiplied by Z. So a lot of calculations I know. But how would I, I do it? M O B D squared, 100 days O B D is M O B D squared divided by 4, divided by 4, and I find the reinforcement. Yes. I don't spend much time. Because I don't spend time finding S, I have enough time to obtain S. But that's why the shortcuts are so important. Because I'm so confident that I can just get the answer by doing this. So I don't spend time finding the red force. I spend time finding the optimum solution. But most, most of the unions do is they spend a lot of time finding the reinforcement and they never bother to look at the optimization. Is that clear, Pan Luper? Yes, it, that's clear, sir. So you guys see the see why we need shortcuts. Mm -hmm. Because you know, finding a reinforcement is a huge business for most of the units. Not for me. Yes, sir. Right? For, from my phone, I can tell the reinforcement. Because on my phone, I can find a movie display. So how do you find M? How do I find M? I'll use a value like WS card or I'll use a value like WS card or A1 in the internal space. I'll use a value like WS card over 9 when it is simply supported at 1 in. But no structure is simply supported like this. So even in this, this span, I'm going to get some, some fixity here. So I'll use WS card or 10 here. Here also WS card or 10. So I don't waste time finding the moment. On the other hand, if I, if I want to find the moment, this is what I do. I don't worry about the full structure. I'll go for a substructure and put it onto set 2000 or my das gen. I'll put dollars here. Create this. Create this bit and then find the venue moment diagram and then I can do wonders. I can redistribute the moments just by looking at the moment. I can decide the diagram. I can decide how much redistribution because uh, redistribution means changing the origin of the venue moment diagram. It's very easy and I can find it. The moment accurate, on the other hand, I can find the moment that approximate and quickly do a design. So, somebody says, Okay, I like to find the shear. So, I find the maximum load multiplied by 0.6. That is the shear force. I don't do a, I don't, if I, somebody asks, What is the shear? I say, Okay, it's 0.6 times the full load. On the other hand, I can find it from the menu moment diagram. Uh, the moment uh, the model is there, you can find the shear force factor. Is that clear, Bandhu? Yes, sir. Clear. So, what is the time now? Uh, now, 8.20, sir. We have several questions as well. Yeah, so shall we answer the question rather than going forward? forward? Uh, yeah, okay, sir. And uh, well, I think, you know, I explained many things today. And the important parameter I'm going to share now. Uh -huh. The important parameter I have to show is this uh, magic number K. K has a magic num K is a magic number. K has a maximum value is 0 0.167. 0 0.167. But when you when you are when you remain MOBD squared below three, this will never be violated. It will always be single. How do I say all that? That look at this. Just give me one. Right. Now look at this. MOBD squared less than 3. What is 100 days of BD? No problem. There's 100 days BD value and it's in the Even if you go up to 4, you can still, if you are, if your grade of concrete is high, you can simply reinforce it, but you know, a lot of reinforcement is needed. So that's why I like a maximum MOVD squared of about three. 
here lot little reinforcement when you go up more reinforcement so i like a value like uh, 2.5 to 3 even 2.5 is okay very little reinforcement can you understand that bandu why i have this magic number 3 Uh, yes, sir. it's a bit clear now. Yeah, because uh, with this uh, three, now I I need this little reinforcement. If it's two, even less. Why? Steel mm. is a very expensive. So why do you want to save concrete when when the expensive material is steel? Use less steel because when you use less steel, your structures are extremely ductile. They 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 are they are very much under reinforced. They will give a lot of warning before failure. so they are good any structure packed with steel is not good they are they are very expensive so select large enough sections what is the other advantage of selecting large beams white beams you can do the construction easily most of the problem crime beams get honeycombs why somebody has selected the width of the beam as how much 250 or 200 What happens when you cast? You can't pour the concrete, so the contractor might give you a phone call and say, "Can you send some teaspoons to pour the concrete? Because there is no space, right? Got it? Yeah, so yes, exactly. Okay, because you need teaspoons to pour concrete. Why? You can't put vibrator. Why? The width is so small. So select a wide bit for the beam. What is the main advantage? Shear capacity is high when the beam is wide. Very easy to do the construction. No honeycombs, no leaks, because it has plenty of space. We can vibrate it properly. We can pour the concrete from above because reinforcement has sufficient gap. So we can, and the structure also very strong because it has high shear capacity. But the point, Madhuga. Yes, sir. Got the point. Is that the way you? That think? is correct. That is correct, sir. <laughs> yeah, that is not the way you think. You think you are <laughs> going to save with B and select a thin B. No. From which you select save, not from the B, from the slab. Hmm. Why? Each slab is reported ten times in a ten-story building. Hmm. So if you sell, if you use fifteen millimeters less, you are going to you are going to save one hundred fifty millimeters. Of concrete, but the reinforcement may be the same because most of the time three D rules or four D rules governs the reinforcement. Got it? Yes, sir. So there are many things we can do in slabs as well, eh? but uh, we need a very good QA QC key. Now you can't do this with, you know, just a uh, supervisor. At least you know you need H N D type people who understand something. Or young engineers who are just graduating, who are looking for jobs. These are very, these they are very good because they don't have much family commitment. It's their first job. They learn a lot about concrete structures with QA as QA QC engineers, so that they can become better engineers one day because they get a lot of construction experience without carrying the burden of project management. Otherwise, you hire a construction engineer. And that person has to carry a lot of burden as construction manager, whereas you get QA QC engineers. They have less burden because they are not doing management; they are assuring the quality. So they can learn a lot, and they are they will be huge boost to the construction manager. Why? Now he need not be looking at the construction; he can do the construction management part rather than doing the construction engineers. So otherwise, what happens in Sri Lanka is you hire one guy, hire one guy. He's paid a big salary. He's supposed to look after the construction management part. He is supposed to look at the QAQC part. He is supposed to do everything. And after a few years, you find you have wasted engineer. Why? That guy has tried to do too many things, and his his efficiency is very low because he that guy is trying to do too many. But so so that is not the way it's operated in other countries. They are they, they use a lot of engineers, and they are they are paid a reasonable salary, not a very high salary. They are paid reasonable salaries. They all work together. 
and they raise the ladder. And as they raise the ladder only, they will get high salaries. But that is not the way it operates in Sri Lanka. We get few engineers. We expect them to do everything. That is not good. But that is not the way Altair was constructed. Altair had a big team of engineers. And they were, they were doing the QAQC part in addition to they were engineers for everything. Right? And the quality of construction is very high. So that's the way you have to look at it. Is that clear? Yeah, that is clear, sir. I think uh, most of the uh, construction companies are uh, not having this QAQC department. Some some companies are having that, I think. But actually, QAQC can come from the client side. Because the QAQC can be independent. Yes. So the, the, the construction company also needs a QAQC site. But imagine that QAQC can come from an independent uh, consultant. Uh, consultant's QAQC also should be there. But it can be client's QAQC. Because client is the one who wants it properly done. So client is, will be willing to spend a little extra money to make sure things have happened properly and he has a proper record of what, the, what this contract has done. So, so you have to educate the client to spend on QAQC. That is a good way of thinking. Look at it. Uh -huh. Okay? Okay, sir. So you have to educate the client. You can say, okay, you have a QAQC department. And uh, as the consultant, I will manage it. But I can't pay for it. I can't pay the QAQC engineers. You pay. But I'll manage it. Right? And for a small fee, I'll manage it. But... Uh, or part of my 1% fee, I'll manage it. But QAQC engineer's uh, salary is your business. And in the in the contract, you will say so many BAC, so many chartered engineers, then so many BAC engineers, and so many QAQC engineers in the contract. So the contractor is forced to cost it and include it in the bid. Because when you go for competitive bidding, you will find that, you know, Contractors give a lot of uh, discounts because they have machinery. They can, they have a lot of things that they can. They don't have to hire. So all this uh, wealth that they have, sometimes they have scaffolding, they have uh, plants. So the cost of hiring is very low for them. So they have already depreciated those plants and machinery and their equipment on their balance sheet. So basically. It's, it's coming almost free of charge for them. Whereas uh, on the when you are when you are finding the rate, all those are included. So so contractors will also find that they can offer pretty good rates, uh, especially because they are getting everything without VAT. So see, there are so many things. So the uh, so you'll find when you hire a big company, when you are a smart engineer, you can uh, bring things down drastically and uh, so that is something that I did recently uh, in a project where the allocation for the foundation was 595 million the original uh, geotechnical engineering report produced a foundation of 800 million now we might uh, we might uh, give the contract for about 400 million and my, my plan is to further optimize it while we are doing it so that we might hit Something like 360 or 375 or 380 million. So just imagine one doing a job of 800 million for 380 million. Can you can you have you ever found that kind of optimization? Bandhu? Uh, no, sir. No. That, but that's what I, I do. I, in in Orgodo at the flyover, the cost was uh, 750 million. We did it for 500 million. Right? And uh, Nigambo Hospital, uh, they were planning to demolish the existing eight-story building and construct a new building with all the medical equipment coming new. The cost was 10,500 million. I completed the whole project for 500, 600 million, giving an extra space of 58,000 square feet. So just imagine 10,500 project was brought down to 600 million. Right? And then I have done a bridge at Mayang, 300 feet long, 10 feet wide. 300 feet long, 10 feet wide, cost us 6 million rupees in 2012. 
so that's the kind of value engineering you should be thinking because value engineering is our future but it cannot be done with conventional thinking and the type of reinforced concrete design or other designs that is taught at universities we can't do it because we have been taught the subject not the application so application is is can be very different so that's why there's a lot of room for value engineering in every uh, project that is undertaken in sri lanka and i can uh, even if we uh, if you talk about altea i didn't design it i only checked it by creating a model and if i design altea today the total weight of altea structure can be brought down to 70% of its weight which means i can do the altea construction for 70% of its original cost have you ever thought that that type of optimization is possible in a intentional design structure no sir uh, huh? can't believe sir <laughs> can't believe yes it's possible if you want i'll tell you uh, towards the end of the lecture series i'll show you how the altea can be designed to weigh 70% of what it is today so that's the final thing i'm going to i'll wind up one day my d25 30 lectures but uh, the final day i'll show you so keep keep that in mind ask that okay. question from me right okay. and i will show you right so okay. what are the questions yeah uh, there are only uh, there are four questions uh, one is a bit long question uh, i will read sir uh, yeah uh, if uh, if the load of the slab distributed to beams as per yield line pattern is it yeah. reasonable curtail is it reasonable curtail bottom reinforcement flows to the corners of the slab on the so actually actually in, in, actually in 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 two way span is slabs uh, no engineer practices this in sri lanka but uh, there is something called all the moments that you calculate based on yield line method is applicable only for the middle strips end strips is not applicable end strips is a nominal rate and okay. no engineer in sri lanka practices that but by practicing the s strip middle strip method you can save a lot of steel in the process okay, okay vandu that's the answer yeah. right so i'll be covering that later but so don't worry uh, in, okay after all the steps are be there's a, another i think it's like a comment uh, i trust yeah. that for flange beams neutral axis should be within the flange to make get the benefits of flange action yes so after next team next week my topic will be flange beams so don't okay. worry i'll ask it next week and uh, the other thing is uh, sir could you explain us the workflow in a bim environment i think he is referring to building information modeling yeah uh, information modeling yes yeah bim so environment so basically basically that is uh, three dimensional modeling and lot of data but uh, but uh, i'm not talking about that yeah. level because you know first thing is you have to get the building right Yeah, he's asking. BIM is only a, only a database, right? BIM is only a database. Okay. So in design, there's a there's a there are two levels. The first level is preliminary design, where wealth of experience should come in, and at that level, BIM can't do anything. But once you design, produce, start producing the drawings, BIM can do a lot of things by coordinating among all the people who are involved in the project. right bim can't do anything at the level that i am talking ah uh, that's what he is asking he is asking bim environment uh, can it be done at this uh, structural design stage something like no, that no, no, no. now this is the initial stage now we are trying to get the numbers right yes okay at the level that you are going to get the numbers right bim can't do anything because bim is a computer tool okay whereas as humans we can think computer can't think computer can code so bim is good for coordination but now we are still at the infancy that is pre designed where we are going to get the numbers right and mm. numbers right is a game where we use the brain so that part cannot be done by computers right okay. computer once we do that part we get the optimum solution coordination of the construction activities of this optimum solution can be done by the computer that is the bim mm-hmm. got it Yes, yes. Got, got it, sir. Okay, question. There's one last question. Uh, 
Yeah. If we expect some amount of shear force in a beam, like uh, 100 kilonewton, using that value, how can we do the flexion and compression reinforcement in a beam? I think... Uh, ah, that is that is uh, some topic that I'm going to cover shortly. Because, you know, okay. shear design, there's a special way you have to think about it. So I'll cover, don't worry. Okay, sir. In the next few lectures, you will learn all that. Okay, sir. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, I think that's all questions. Uh, yeah. uh, then I would like to. Uh, no, actually, actually, I'm going very slow because I just want to get you to think yes, different. Sir. Yeah, that's better. Right? Sir. Yeah, because uh, getting you to change the way of thinking is not an easy task. Yes, sir. Yeah. And also, I thought, yeah. sir, that this uh, value engineering uh, part that is very, I I felt it is very important. So. What can we do to uh, take this to practicing engineer, engineers in a more efficient way? No, we are doing no, this. No, are no, doing... no. What we have to say is, you know, you, you individual now, they, they have been 144 years yes. today. Yes. And there will be many more who will go through this lecture when it is available on uh, YouTube. Yes. Okay. So if all of them start doing value engineering, yeah. those who are not doing value engineering will have no place. Ah, uh, okay. right. So that's how it goes. So and also you tell the client, okay, uh, you you get a design done by a normal engineer. I'll pay his fee. Then uh -huh. I'm going to do value engineering, reduce that fee by twenty percent or thirty percent. You pay me that ten percent of that, and I'll pay that uh, average engineer's design. Fee. Because you know, when you are in a 5,000 million, let's say 5,000 million big project, 30 story or 40 story building, right? It will cost 5,000 million, right? And you are going to reduce the cost of it by 40%, structure's cost. So make it, so in a 5,000 5, million project, 2,000 million will be the structure. Out of 2,000 million, you save. 20%, sorry, 40%. So, so you save uh, 400 million, right? Okay. Whereas the design fee is 5 million, sorry, 50, 50 million. So you are saving, sorry, uh, I got the, the wrong. Say the whole project is 2,000, 5,000 million, your, your structure is, uh, the, the, Structural cost is 2000 million and the structural engineer is going to charge 2% of that. Structural engineer is going to charge 2% of that. That is 40 million. Right? So, structural engineer is going to charge 40 million. Right? But if you are doing this, you will charge not 10% because you might charge about uh, 20%. And uh, so, 2000 million project, you are going to save 40%. Then, you are, you are saving. 800, 800 million, right? And even if you charge 10%, you lost, your, your charge will be 80 million. So even if you pay that engineer 40 million, it's worth. Because you are going to get 40 million anyway. And Grant is going to save how much? 800 million. Have you got the point, Yes, yeah, Yes, I got the point, yes. So, so yeah. you can pay the engineer's fee also. <laughs> by doing value engineering, you can say, okay, you get this done by an, uh, any engineer in the field. Right. So he gets the job done like, because he has no cost and you cost it properly. Then you do the value engineering, save everything possible, and then you pay that engineer, average engineer, his fee, and you give the rest. Who is the winner? You are a winner. That engineer who had done the job is also a winner. Client is also a winner. Yes, sir. Okay. Not only that, because client will have a QA QC department under his, uh, paid by him with the savings. Now, young engineers will get jobs. Yes, sir. As they pass out, they will have jobs, plenty of jobs in the industry. Hmm. Who are the winners? Everybody is a winner. Yes, sir. Got it? Got it, sir. Okay, yeah. so let's That's think different. And uh, I would like to uh, invite a uh, civil engineering section committee chairman, uh, engineer Mangala Silva, uh, to do the vote of thanks and wind up the session.
Uh, yes, sir. Um, sorry that, that actually I couldn't participate at the very beginning. I couldn't log into that one. Um, once again, I would like to say thank you very much to Pro Professor Jai Singh. And uh, um, Professor Jai Singh has mentioned something about he's willing to do a value engineering at the end of the session. I think, sir, we can arrange a physical session for that one. Yes, yes. Okay. No so I, th I think that would be the most interesting part thing. So um, I can, when you are ready, please let us know. We will arrange up the physical no, physical no, 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 no. for that part. The, the rate that is the, that I think going... that is how the value comes, yeah. right? Yeah. The, no. So, the, at the rate at the at the rate that we are progressing, we yeah. might need about thirty five to forty lectures to finish this. Yeah. So nearly eight months to finish this. Yes, so it's all right. I mean, uh, when you're ready, maybe uh, we don't need to stay until end of the lecture session. So when you're ready, sir, you let let us know. We will yeah, arrange okay. a physical lecture, right? Okay, okay. And also, I want to say thank you to Kamala Madam at the very beginning, her, um, her inputs for this lecture series. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, at last, not least, but I want to say thank you very much, Banduka, for organizing this everything. Thank you yeah, very yeah. much. Good time. Yeah, really Good time. thank you to Manduka because he organized, he, he coordinates yeah, yeah. next day. Yes, uh, next day, next day lecture will be uh, flange beans. Okay. 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 Design of flange beans. Right? Okay. Okay. Professor Jaisman, I am Vijay Ratna from yeah. UK. Thank you for ah, all your... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I am the one who posted that uh, the flange beam case. You know, I just want to say... I, I was just yeah. trying to catch you sometime, but I miss you. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's very, very good lecture. Nice very good huh? lecture. Is this yeah, uh, yeah. Mr. MD Vijay Ratna? Start yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's after a long time. This. So, yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I was lucky to find time to participate in this lecture. The yeah, reason yeah. is, today I am sick and at home, so that is why. <laughs> right, 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 right. But you yeah, can yeah. download watch it uh, vijay yeah uh, yeah definitely yeah. yeah i i this time i came last december i went to university to oh, look for you oh. but i couldn't find right <laughs> so i'm at pillyandal now so oh, anyway, okay. vijay, uh, you know i knew vijay from 1987 he was 7 years senior to us at university is that right yeah yeah right yes, Priya, yes. professor priyanda is batchmate <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. yes yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one thing away, I'm 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 following up some lectures, you know, so all that, you know. No, you can I'm actually, you can different... actually try uh, my YouTube channel, Advanced Computer Modeling of Structures, which uh, which is uh, which contains so many videos on computer modeling and all that. Mm -hmm. Advanced Computer Modeling of Structures on YouTube. Okay, that is what my new subject is. I'm also in the advanced yes. analytics team of WSP, doing all high-end ah, yes. products like cable structures, yes. vibration analysis, yeah, fatigue yeah. design. Right. Those are my subjects yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you can actually try uh, MTR right. dashing, advanced computer modeling of structures. Type my name and then type advanced computer modeling of structures. That's my uh, YouTube channel of uh, computer modeling stuff. You can learn a lot by going through Yeah, that. yeah, definitely. Definitely. Oh, thank you very much thank for your you much. Uh, kind yeah, cooperation yeah. and yeah. all very nice lecture and it's very very yeah. uh, this thing value engineering is a very valuable yeah. field here in UK yeah. either. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. A great time. I'll catch yeah, you once you. again. Yeah, Mr. Vijay Ratna ran Stat Consultants uh, until he left Sri Lanka in nine two thousand something. Is that right, Vijay? Two thousand six. Yes. Two thousand six. Yeah. Yes. Okay, then. Okay. Thank you very much. Glad, glad to hear your voice again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> right. yeah. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to talk. Thank you for yeah, allowing yeah. me to talk. And also, and also Mr. Vijayaratna followed our first MSc batch, 1995. Yeah. 96, and he did the MSc also with me under my supervision on Windows. High-rise buildings and wind engineering. Yeah, and wind and seismic engineering. We have a paper on ISL, which is used by engineers on uh, the wind behavior, dynamic behavior of uh, of build, tall buildings under wind. And yeah, it was yeah, published in 1998. Transactions. Yeah. I have done a massive building in Iran, so which is uh, highly oh. seismic, and I, I definitely 
Uh, every time I can remember what you so, told Vijay, me. So Vijay, are you in a position to share a lecture for us with what your, what, whatever what, your... What, what, what kind of a subject? No, whatever subject you feel yeah. comfortable, we are willing to hear, listen to. Yeah, generally I am doing a lot of fatigue design, vibration analysis. So you can, you can, you can, you can, you can, the vibration analysis, fatigue design is a very good topic for Sri Lankan engineers. If you can do about one or two lectures under this series, it's, it will be very helpful. Okay, we'll try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, 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 then. Thank you very much. Okay. Is, is your telephone number still the same? Yeah, yeah, same number. Okay, okay. I'm on WhatsApp also. You can uh, try okay, that right, number and send you your WhatsApp number. Okay, I will send an invite. Okay, thank you. My God, I am, I am very pleased today that I was able to catch you. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> For the last so many years, I was just trying to struggle. I, did, I didn't come, only came only four or five times to Sri Lanka. Every time I miss you. I'm very sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, All my, yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Wish you so, all happy new yeah, we all wish you all a very happy new year. I forgot to tell, tell that. <laughs> because today is a sad day uh, because my Isra Supa is in Cambridge, has uh, just passed away this morning. So, oh, uh, not a good day uh, because he was a brilliant bridge design engineer called Professor Chris Burgoy. One of the oh, best okay. in the world. Yeah. Ah, I have met him here once. Ah, right. Yes. Yeah, you know, long ago, about 10 years ago. Yeah. He retired in 2017 it. and uh, to, by yeah. this time he's about 73 years. Yeah, maybe. He at the age of 67, only 73, mm -hmm. but uh, he was a very healthy man. Suddenly he got some problem and passed away. Yeah, yeah. We really don't know what is the exact problem, but uh, just admitted to the hospital within one or two hours, he has uh, died. Mm -hmm. so not a, he's a lucky person without suffering. Yeah, he's a lucky man, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay then, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you all very much. Very kind okay, of you. Okay, okay, bye. Okay. okay, I'm leaving now. Okay, okay, okay sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.